Hi, I'm Kenneth Sewell, Vice President for Research at Oklahoma State University, welcoming you to this month's edition of OSU Research on Tap. Each month, I sit down with an OSU scientist, artist, or scholar for an informal chat in front of a live audience at Stillwater's Iron Monk Brewery. This is a great way to get a glimpse into the fascinating research these talented individuals carry out at OSU. I hope you enjoy this edition and tune back in each month for a new one. Cheers. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kenneth Sewell, Vice President for Research at Oklahoma State University, and I'm here to welcome you to another edition of OSU Research on Tap. Help me welcome our guest this evening, Dr. Sky Cooley, who is Assistant Professor of Strategic Communication at OSU. So our conversation on this Mardi Gras season, notice I have my uh, nice Mardi Gras uh, uh, set of OSU Pistol Pete beads going for you today. Uh, with tomorrow being Fat Tuesday, I thought it was appropriate to wear that. Um, but this, this kind of talk could happen at any time. So we're going to talk to Dr. Cooley about how the stories we tell ourselves impact national security. So thank you for being here with us uh, tonight, Sky. Um, now, we're, we're going to come back around to this national security aspect in just a bit. But to get us started, Let's talk about what you mean by the stories we tell ourselves. Now, I, I know you're a strategic communications guy, so you study media of various sorts. So when you say stories, are you really just talking about like stories in the news? Or are you talking about something that might be, uh, dare I say it, more psychological, like <laughs> stories we tell ourselves? Well, first of all, thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I'm from Louisiana, so Mardi Gras season Mardi Gras. And, Here we and, and festival. Um, uh, when we talk about stories, and, well, when we talk about narrative and the stories within them, we are talking about something uh, psychological um, in that we're talking about the way that the brain sequences and orders the objects that you encounter in your day-to-day your, your -day life and environment and how you contextualize those with all of your previous experiences. Um, the way that we make sense of our environment um, is through story. So it doesn't matter if you are thinking about how you're going to go up to the counter and, and order a beer. It doesn't matter if you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner this evening. Um, and it doesn't matter if you want to think about yourself as uh, whether or not you think of yourself as a good person or a good parent. All of those things are done through narrative. And what we do is we really look at those different elements of stories uh, that people tell to try to get a better understanding of their perspectives on the world. An example of this um, on like a societal scale would be to imagine that you watched every movie that came out of South Korea or India or pick a country and you watched every movie that came out this last year uh, from that country. Uh, imagine what you would know about that society if every sci-fi movie portrayed like a dystopian future versus whether it portrayed a very utopian future. Imagine what you could learn about social norms and etiquette, how to eat, uh, what would, uh, how to greet someone in public. Um, imagine what a hero would look like or what you might learn about a hero or, or, or heroic action or even a villain. Uh, and so those are the elements of story that we really try to pay attention to. Our research group, the, the MESA group here at Oklahoma State, University, we work with, I'm going to throw out a ton of acronyms, so just, you know, bear with me. I uh, don't do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we work with um, the Strategic Multilayered Assessment Group in the Pentagon. And uh, what they ask us to do is to look at the stories that are coming from other nations about what they think about national security, what they think about their political process, uh, what their concerns are over U.S. positions. And so uh, in very real senses, we live out and perform the stories that we tell one another, and our job is to go in and, and dig deeper into those stories to make sense of them. Okay, so let's take one of your more prominent projects, because you did one that looked at the perceptions of certain foreign countries on our last U.S. presidential election, and we're not going to get political here, I promise, <laughs> but, but, but you, you, were, you, you did this project that looked at the perceptions of these countries in reference to our last elections. So before we get into what you found, Help us understand what your inputs were, what, what you used as your data for sure. this study. So this study came across um, from CENTCOM, our U.S. Central Command, uh, and they had asked uh, the think tank that we work with, the SMA, to analyze basically how different nations and areas of the world were going to respond to the potential change of, or 
the changing of guard that was going to be the new U.S. administration coming in and how they might respond for, to one candidate versus the other. And they gave us a whole series of questions to look at, but we, were, we figured since we were already doing this work that we might as well run a parallel study that just looked at the election. Um, and so to do that, we were at the time we're working with a system called the M3S or the Multimedia Monitoring System. It's a Raytheon produced technology. Um, it was available to us from Texas A&M, which is where uh, Dean Randy Kluver and Global Studies, he was there at the time at Texas A&M. Uh, we've been working together for a long time. And so uh, that system, uh, it pulled broadcast, print journalist, and social media data coming from China, um, Russia, and a variety of countries across the Middle East, including Iran. Um, and basically what you got from that was a transcription of whether it was the social media stuff or the broadcast stuff or the um, online uh, news sources. It was really uh, just every single thing that was actually said, written, and produced in those languages and in those formats from the sources we had, about 30 for each country uh, that we looked at uh, across a wide variety of political spectrums. And what it allowed you to do was put in certain keywords and it would filter out all those stories for you. And so that was our data point. We basically looked at news media that was available, open source material, so nothing like classified or, or secret or on the dark web, everything that was publicly available. And it was basically just a scraper system that pulled all those news sources for us. Gotcha. And for that project, that's what we used. Okay. So now you and your team use what I've read in some of your work called a narrative toolkit. And that sounds like something you could teach an undergrad in an afternoon, but I don't think it is. So, so what are the tools in your toolkit? Sure, so uh, one of the advantages that we've got with working with the SMA is uh, when, when CENTCOM or PACOM or, or Project NOR ask any uh, question to us, we work with a, a, a wide variety of teams, like uh, somewhere between 20 to 30 different organizations and entities. Some of them are private industry, some of them are other academics, um, think tanks themselves. Uh, and then sometimes we're working with you know, stuff that the military produces in-house. And in seeing the way that they packaged what they do, we, you, know, you get to see a lot of different skill sets that are presented in sort of neat little you know, phrases. So our narrative toolkit was an effort to kind of condense all the different things that we do into like a packageable, this is what we bring to the table. Um, narrative theory is really flexible. As I said earlier, you can look at it at like an individual level. Right now we're on a, a project with CENTCOM that looks at de-radicalization uh, potentials or inoculation against radicalization for at-risk youth and refugee camps in Syria. So we can, we can hone down in on, on individuals and the stories that they tell themselves. Or, as I mentioned earlier, you can look at large societal types of, of stories. What the narrative toolkit is, is all the different perspectives that we're able to bring to bear on any particular topic of interest or question that's being asked. It's, uh, sometimes it's field work that we go and talk to local communities in Oaxaca or Tijuana. Sometimes it's pulling news media stories. Sometimes it's looking at different policy initiatives and the way they're crafted. Sometimes it's looking at television shows. But it's a narrative analysis of different stories and all of those different stories layered. To do that, we use a wide variety of techniques. We um, have very qualitative types of, type of work that we do that's very human oriented, looking for themes and story. Um, the way that character, characters are portrayed or picking out nuanced things like irony. Uh, but we also use uh, very systematic algorithmic types of functions. We work with a lot of different computers. Algorithmic science. functions, that sounds like math. Yeah, Be yeah, it is math. Right. It's, um, it's, we work with a lot of computer scientists that will help us do word co-occurrences. So we had a project once where they asked us to identify, they gave us a list of names and they wanted to know every time that name popped up and what places they were going to. Um, so we can do things like that. We can also trace narrative patterns. So if you've ever seen a rom-com, you know exactly how the story is going to end. You know exactly where the rise in action is going to be and the drop in action. You can actually pattern that out um, visually. So we can do that. Uh, and we can also trace the spread of specific narratives. So we're working on a project now with Ohio State University in their Mirshan Center for International Security Studies, where we're looking at disinformation narratives that come from China and how they pop up all across the globe. And so we're looking at the geography of it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, you can think of it like an actual mapping structured it. mapping yeah. of it. Yeah. So everything from like a human read to these more metric-driven mappings. That's so some of this is done by artificial intelligence tools and computer tools, but other of it is done by you and the students you train. That's right, uh, we also just have- read this stuff and map it out. Yeah, we create, what we try to do for the human side of it is uh, we'll do like a, a deep dive into the air. We normally work with people, if we're looking at Russia, for example, we have people who have lived in Russia or are from Russia. 
um, that know the language, that understand the contextual nuances and of the environment. So it's not enough just to know the language? No, it's not enough to know the language. You have to have a sense of the place and the people. I mean, uh, imagine listening to uh, the, the speech that Dr. Martin Luther King gave um, or versus reading a transcript of it, how differently it comes across. Um, the, the human element and all the different nuances and layers that we bring to our language and to the stories that we tell is it's very rich. It's not just a, about reading something. It's, you have to have a cultural understanding. You have to have an understanding of the history of a place. And so we try to bring that in. And that also informs the way that we do not artificial intelligence. We call it, it's called human in the loop uh, machine learning, where there's like a human overseer of all of the different algorithms that are being run just to check and just to make sure that the appropriate context is, is, is being applied over to the automated coding. OK. so kind of following this one project through. So you had all this scraped news media, social media, broadcast media, print media from these countries, China, Russia, and across the Middle East. Thousands and thousands of words. I'm probably millions of words, yeah, thousands of reams of paper, I'm sure, if you, if you printed it all out. And you did, you applied this narrative toolkit. Now, I know you, uh, you, you did enough on this to publish a book, so you're not going to be able to tell us all that you learned. But, but what are the major takeaways um, from, from this? How, what did you, what, how can you boil down what, on this project, just to give us a sense of... For, for the book project, the um, <laughs> U.S. democracy, when on display in a mediated format, uh, makes a really solid case against itself. Um, <laughs> that's the main takeaway. It's so divisive, it's so binary, it is so oppositional that all one need really do is just put it on display for another person to see, and it's hard to make a, a case for that system of governance. <laughs> um, it, it well, looks, there's a famous quote of democracy is the worst form of government <laughs> except every other one that's ever been devised, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's Churchill. I, yeah. I didn't get it quite right, yeah. it's a Churchill quote. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's right. And man, you can really, you could really see it in, in the coverage that it was used by authoritarian, more authoritative leaning systems um, to really validate um, why democracy is a chaotic, turbulent, not something that you'd want to necessarily adopt. Some of the more specific takeaways to the Middle Eastern region, um, I would say that there was really a want for stability in U.S. policies. Uh, that was tied to a, a victimization narrative that we found throughout the, throughout the coverage. Uh, a lot of Middle Eastern nations really viewed themselves as being victimized by U.S. policies. And what they wanted more than anything else from uh, a U.S. president was just stability. Just tell us what you're going to do. You know, what's the plan here? Like, what's the logic behind what you're doing? And as soon as we know that, you know, we'll kind of adjust and, and we'll be okay with. Uh, from, Ch from Chinese perspective, uh, what they really wanted more than anything, matching a narrative of presenting themselves to both a domestic and international audience as an ascendant superpower, as it were. Um, the, the key to their whole system is access to the economic marketplace, right? Um, that the status quo of the rules and, and free trade were going to remain so that they could you know, maintain their rise in middle class. And so they were very anti-Trump in their coverage and were, were far more leaning towards Clinton just because of that very factor. Uh, and then Russia. Um, Man, over the years, it's just become, there's been so many resets with U.S. administrations in Russia. Um, and they never work. Uh, and so the Russia's presentation was really just sort of looking for, for easy, soft punches to, to hit the U.S. with. Kind of like, chinks in the armor. To yeah, some that's yeah. right. And to point them out, uh, you know, just over and over again, like to highlight this is why you don't want Western-led democracy. This is why Western-led democracy is hypocritical. And again, uh, from the Russian side, they have been presenting themselves as sort of on the outside of the West looking in for quite some time now. They, they're, they're really keen in, in the Putin era to present themselves as a counterbalance to uh, U.S.-led and particularly uh, the more negative aspects of, of Western capitalism, like a counterbalance to that, their managed democracy, their managed economic systems, their mafia style state, if you want to be completely transparent, um, to, to sort of justify that. And so to do so, they just took the U.S. to task at every single opportunity. They really weren't pro any candidate other than just wanting to see the U.S. process be chaotic. Okay, so from an academic perspective, I'm an academic, you're an academic, 
it's cool when we learn things, but you know, you're, you're being asked to do this work primarily because of its uh, national security implications. So at the, not at the research on tap level, uh, Iron Monk on a Monday evening, but the book level, you know, really digging deep and understanding it. Who do you expect can make use of these findings? You know, and, and, and what are they, what, what are they going to do with them? What could they do? You know, who can really take your, your research and turn it into something that is positive for our national security? Cool, that's a great question. Um, so most of what we do, as I said before, is we work with these layered teams, uh, right? So one question, 20 groups looking at one question and then sort of synthesizing that all down. Most of the, the groups that we work with, most of the, the people that work in, in the policy side that we're on, they're running some kind of like algorithm. They've got some kind of, of machine learning tool that they're applying to whatever the problem is. I'll give you an example of this. Um, the, the Athena project run at George Washington University, they're almost on every single project that we were a part of, and they're really just a wargaming system, right? And so they look at all the resources that a country has militarily, they look at all the resources that you've got, and they say, if country X does this, then country Y is gonna do this, and they sort of game it out that way. <laughs> and that's great, and there are some aspects where those kinds of predictions work well. The advantage of our system and our narrative toolkit is that we don't deal in prediction at all. We don't even deal with the necessary reality of what's actually taking place on the ground. Everything that we're dealing with is sort of the cognitive present moment for a given group of people. How the they way understand people it. understand it, not necessarily the way it is. Exactly. Yeah. And the best way to use that or the best way that I can sort of illustrate using that is to imagine if you've got one of those like dreaded speed ticket camera things that they hide in the woods and you're going you know five miles an hour over the speed limit and it zaps you with a ticket right like that's the algorithm type of function like that's a knowing your speed one unit and you get a ticket for that the difference between that and a police officer in the woods or you know behind a sign or wherever they like to hide is that um, they're taking into account what time of day it is how many other cars are on the road what the normative speed for traffic is in that community at that particular time, whether or not the car itself looks to be different than other vehicles that have come through the area in the past, and whether or not the cop has had you know, a bunch of donuts and some coffee and just doesn't feel like turning on the siren this time around. And it's that context of the moment that we're able to add over to all of those different algorithms and, and, and products. And so in many, many ways, the way that our product is used is to give real practical insight into the decisions that are being made from without our insight, a really one-sided perspective uh, of, of policy making. And so that's how we- So policy making, so that includes potentially politicians mm -hmm. using this information yeah. or diplomats or military leaders who, well, who really use it? We, we do work with global ties, uh, which has got a diplomatic function, obviously. Um, we've, we're sort of increasing our presence with them, but most traditionally we work, like we've worked with General Votel. Um, we've worked with a number of different colonels and majors in CENTCOM. We basically, my level in, ac in the academy is an assistant professor. I talk with mid-level commanders in the military basically once a week. Uh, I inform the, our, I'm sorry, the MESA group, our team informs them on whatever relevant question they're asking. We're giving them a perspective on that. And we do that weekly. So we talk with military decision makers and then at these senior review groups that the Pentagon has, we get to talk with both policymakers and command leaders for various branches of the U.S. military. And now that we've been working with DHS for the last year and a half, I guess. DHS, uh, Department, uh, sorry, of yeah, Department of Homeland Security. Sorry, yeah, Department of Homeland Security. We've been working with them for the last year and a half, and uh, we do get to talk to some policymakers and some of their more senior members that do the job of relaying the policy t to the policymakers so that we don't have to get super political. So the, uh, you know, the kind of the term that's been around for the last few years, this makes me think of is, you know, in the Vietnam era, we had to take the hill, you know, win the battle. But it's since then, we've heard a lot more about winning hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. And to win hearts and minds, they have to understand how people are, under, are, are making sense <coughs> of, of what's going on. Yeah, no joke. So literally, um, Friday, yeah, Friday of this last week, we were uh, talking with folks from Department of Homeland Security on a project that we've got upcoming. And one of the, the policy writers, uh, we're looking at um, migration coming from the Northern Triangle, that's 
uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, and, and just the, 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 the collapse of that whole area, the, the state collapse that's happening, that's fueling the, the migration uh, crisis. And what this, this person was asking was like, hey, you know it would be great? If you could just give us like a lexicon of terms that we would use so we wouldn't sound so one-sided. Like, just, how do we even talk about migrants, the migrant journey in a way that would, would resonate with those communities? So everything as simplistic as like particular terms of language to elaborate as the actual origin stories as to why a problem's happening. We give insight to those. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I warned you ahead of time that we'd take a little mini break here because cool. I have a few announcements because everybody gets kind of intense on this. So there's two reasons I take this break. One is that so Amy can bring me another beer. Um, <laughs> but the other is so that I can remind you that there is actually a bar up there and it, uh, Iron Monk is a, is a wonderful brewery that partners with us and we want to be good partners. So please... The informal environment, we're going to get to Q&A here in a little bit, but take, take the opportunity to, to go grab another beer. Just a couple of announcements. In addition to the beer, they do have sodas. They've also added wine. I'm a proponent of the beer. I mean, it is what they make here. Uh, but please uh, take advantage of that. We also want to thank our refreshment sponsors, the Riata Center for Entrepreneurship at Spear School of Business. If you hadn't made it back to the refreshments, if I didn't eat them all beforehand, there might be some back left in the back there. Now few uh, OSU related announcements. We, throughout the, the year 2020, we are going to be announcing and promoting uh, various signature research events that are open to the public on campus. So a couple of those that are coming up on February 25th, right around the corner, in Murray Hall, room 035, there'll be a public lecture called A Need for Chaos and Motivations to Share Hostile Political Rumors. Interesting. So. We, we, we hear hostile political rumors, so this is somebody who, who actually theorizes about why, that, why there would be a need to share those. Coming up on February 27th, the Department of Sociology will be hosting Dr. Margaret Kovach from the University of Saskatchewan, and she'll be discussing indigenous research methodologies. Uh, and that will be in the Math and Computer Science um, Building Room 101 at 2 o'clock on the 27th. And on March 4th, if you haven't attended this event before, I encourage you to do so. The OSU Library will be hosting their annual Celebrating Books by OSU Authors. In addition to getting to interact with the various authors that have published books, you might even be, yeah, there. We'll be there. I believe you'll be there. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll get to see the, the great array of, uh, of, of talent that we have at, at OSU, particularly in the book publishing realm, which crosses a, a, broad, a broad array of expertise. Just a couple of Iron Monk announcements. I like to promote some of the things they have going on. February 22nd, gosh, that's just a few days away here, is Iron Monk's fifth anniversary. So come out and help them celebrate that. They're going to be doing lots of fun things on their fifth anniversary. For all things Iron Monk, including music that they do right here in this, uh, in this corner of the, uh, of, of the tap room and other special events, uh, follow them on Facebook and Instagram. They do a good job of getting the word out. Now, our OSU Research on Tap events, like, like where you are tonight, can also be viewed on O-State TV. And we do a special edit of the show, which serves as an episode of the Inside OSU podcast. So if you, if you like to uh, get your, your stimulation on the, on the uh, uh, an orally only, I'm a podcast fan myself. Don't need to be banging on the microphone. Sorry about that. Um, you can check out the OSU, the Inside OSU podcast. There's a lot of different kinds of podcasts, but we do these events once a month. So about once a month, we take one of the episodes of that and and uh, and have our OSU research on tap interview there. Our next research on tap, just fair warning, I'll come back to it in a little bit, but it's going to be a week later than normal because of our spring break. We're going to kick it to the next week, which is March 23rd at 5:30 right here at Iron Monk Tap Room. So put that on your calendar as soon as you can. I'll tease you with the topic of that uh, at the end of tonight's show. So back to Dr. Cooley. Now, we've mainly talked about this one specific project. You've mentioned a few others, just kind of mentioned them, but give us a sense of what all is in the pipeline for you and your team. What kinds of research is, is coming up for, for, for your team? Okay. Uh, so right now we are closing out uh, a study for U.S. Central Command that looked at de-radicalization or inoculation um, potentials for radical 
inoculation against radicalization. Not inoculation. They're going to give them a shot. That's and they're right. They're not going to be able right. to radicalize them. Well, actually, what we found is that uh, if you look at radicalization, um, what happens is they, they call it a lack of pluralization from your world inputs. So you become very, like, narrowly focused. And that sounds of, like everybody who has a Facebook account. Yeah, right? yeah. well, yeah. Joel Penny wrote a really good book that my class is reading called The, uh, the Citizen Marketer that talks about that very thing, how you just brand yourself on, on social media platforms rather than having a discussion. Uh, but we, we designed some narrative-based games that have um, children sort of create co-create stories and then have them reflect on their roles within that uh, to help if, if pluralize their worldview. So we're wrapping that up. Uh, we also did a study on Egyptian and the Gulf of Levant uh, that we're wrapping up on the 27th. Our biggest project that we're rolling into, we just got, for us, a, a pretty big grant. It's about $180,000 for a one-year project uh, looking at the migration crisis, uh, again, coming from um, the Northern Triangle. That is funded through Borders Trade and Immigration Institute at the University of Houston, uh, which is supported by the Department of Homeland Security. We are also finalists for a Minerva Project grant uh, that will look at disinformation uh, coming from China across elections in Southeast Asia. We're partnered with Air University, uh, Ohio State's Marishan Center. Um, we, there's gonna I be appreciate that you said Ohio State and not the Ohio yeah, State. Yeah, you know, yeah. That I, was at, I was over there just two weeks ago in Columbus uh, for, for a conference, and they were all doing that. Even their sign has the Ohio State University. So, yes, just Ohio State University. Um, but uh, if we get that, that'll be a, a pretty enormous project for us, a, a year-long undertaking. Um, the now you, now, you, so disinformation. I, people hear that term a lot, especially mm -hmm. nowadays. So... We all know what information is, and we know what misinformation is. We've been told something that's not true. Can you quickly give us an idea of what you mean by disinformation? Yeah, so factual misrepresentations, really that can be verified as factually misrepresented, and we actually don't uh, make that decision ourselves. We actually use a lot of different fact-checking organizations that will say this claim is false and then look for those things specifically within media. So we're actually looking at a variety of different fact-checking sources that are online we're pulling certain elements from those to look for in media, finding those in Chinese media, seeing the way they're packaged, mapping them, as we said, and then looking for those stories and narratives, matriculation across. They, they, what they do is they use these things called submarine sites um, or the sock puppet, sock puppet uh, social media accounts where they're basically just bots and trolls that are constantly bombarding the, the information environment or the public sphere of a given area. And we're trying to see how much of that uh, disinformation comes specifically from China that we can absolutely trace by showing them first in the Chinese context. And so, gotcha. um, and all the computational side of that is going to be from Ohio State University, frankly speaking. Uh, we're going to be doing more of the narrative assessment that actually looks at what those disinformation narratives entail, how they play on certain cultural elements within different Southeast Asian countries. Um, so we're doing that project. Uh, five projects will get funded of 17. We don't know yet if we're going to be one of the 17. Uh, we will roll into another strategic multi-layered assessment, or SMA, contract in March. Uh, we've worked with them for about eight years now, and so it's a solid relationship, and we'll certainly keep that going with whatever, whatever questions they have. And then we have toyed with the idea of doing another election study, just depending on how many of these other things sort of land and move. But um, I don't know. It's, it's such a... Politics right now and coverage of the elections is just so contested, and it really does paint you into a corner if you start doing that. So I don't know how keen we would be yeah. on doing that specifically, but certainly those other projects work. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to have you here, and I really appreciate the conversation. We're about to open it up for questions. But you know, people think of the research we do and how it can contribute to at, at OSU and how that might contribute to national defense or national safety. And I think it's easy to, to pigeonhole some of the, the engineering research that might be related to aerospace or even weaponry and so forth as being you know, the only stuff that could contribute to national defense research. So I think it's fascinating and I hope it's been illuminating for people to see how the more uh, narrative, social science, political science, strategic communication science um, can be a part of that national defense conversation in a way that's very useful to our national leaders. I appreciate you sharing this with yeah, us. Yeah, we have, I mean, we live in this information environment now, and, and, and it's really technologically driven. And so even everything from what the technology aspects give you are just more surgical ways of applying military objectives. So 
um, you don't have to go blow a place up. You can knock out their internet, for example, or you can flood their internet with specific messages. Um, and so there, or maybe even just understand how the people are using the internet that they have. Yeah, might, might that, be of, of military value. And the other thing that's really fascinating, the, the other thing that's really fascinating, and I'll, I'll just pitch it to my class one more time to get them involved in the conversation just a little bit. Uh, my graduate class, everybody, not my undergraduate class. Um, they're reading a book called Transnationalizing the Public Sphere, and it's this idea of, uh, by, by Fraser that you can now participate in places within there. There's a joke that the Russians can't participate in the upcoming Olympics, but they can participate in the upcoming U.S. elections. And, <laughs> and, and that's really the environment that we live in now, right, is trying to figure out whose voice matters where, and in part, it, it sort of in, it involves moving beyond just our regular notions of, of citizenship and sovereign territories and trying to understand the dynamics of global media in just new and, and more illuminating ways. And it's cool to be kind of riding the wave of that with U.S. security stuff. So it's been fun. Fantastic. Well, I've got to have all the fun up to now. Uh, so we want to open up for questions. And the questions can be about anything that's been said. Or we've got one back here and a couple up front. So we'll start back there because the famous uh, orange ball, which is also a microphone, you have to have ah, it. Nice. So tell us who you are before you ask the question, and, and then uh, we'll throw that right. to uh, uh, Dr. Thank you. I'm Jorge Atiles, uh, Education and Human Sciences. You talked about the media right here in the United States uh, that you really don't know who to believe because, you know, you see both um, sides, and uh, you also talk about the messages that we tell ourselves so that we believe. Um, how do you account for propaganda? You know, in your studies, have you been able to actually conceptualize that and be able to use it to be, really understand the mood of a nation about a topic? That's a really awesome question and a difficult one to answer, um, to be honest. We do account for propaganda in the sense that, uh, again, we do not base any of the analysis we do. We, we don't go in with the assumption that we're about to, to dig into reality, like at all. Um, so. Uh, we're, we're not trying to mine something to, to if, if, say, for example, the Russians are talking about a, a, a new space program that they're building in some part in Siberia, and it's going to be fantastic, and it's going to revitalize the economy. And we're going to uh, have people coming from all over the world, um, and we're going to be a leader in the space industry. And that comes out in their narrative all the time. They talk about that all the time. They talk about their linkage to the Orthodox Church. Um, we don't look at the reality of that. Instead, we take the story as the story and try to understand what are, the, what are the cultural aspects in this society that make that particular message resonate so well. How does it match over to other stories that are being told? How does it match over to a sense of identity, of place, and purpose? So with that particular example of the, of the space, it kind of brings back the whole space race of the 60s exactly. and where we're going to be ahead of the United States. And Exactly. Yeah. It's a rehash yeah. of, of old narratives. And the tie with the, or, with the Orthodox Church is a move to help validate the Putin regime as something other than a democracy, uh, more like a czarship kind of back in the day, right? Sort of rekindling those old relationships. And it resonates. People already know it. They've got a, a cultural history of it. And that's what we look at. It's an awesome question. And Dr. Eric Nisbet at Ohio State University does a lot of computational stuff on this. And it really is fascinating to get their perspective because it's so radically divorced from the way that we treat propaganda because they really do look at it um, in ways that identify it and, and sort of try to understand whether it's real or not real. And I, you, there, there are value to, there's value to that perspective, but for us, we're looking into the, the richness of the story being told. I hope that's responsive to your question. Thank you. Here in front. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not very techy, <laughs> but I'd like to know the best fact check organization that I could use. Oh, well, let me be honest with you that um, I do not proclaim to be an expert in that either. Dr. Eric Nisbet at Ohio State University is the one that has all of that stuff mapped out. I will, however, get your email and give you a list of all those sources that we'll use for that. Okay. Different question yeah. right here? Well, slightly. Uh, you know, <clears throat> it looks like disinformation and fake news is on the horizon for the next several months in America mm -hmm. because of what we seem to be getting in politics. Again, and I was wondering how can we, how do we make, live through it, you know, what do we do? So How do we find the truth in those disinformations? 
I, I was at a, a conference specifically just about disinformation and, and, and mapping it and trying to figure out what its implications are. Interestingly enough, my biggest takeaway from uh, the fake news conversation from the whole conference, it was like a four-day event. It was one of those where like, they paid for you to be there and to speak, so you had to be at everything, so you had to be at every single panel. So I was at every single one of them. And uh, the, the biggest takeaway was, to believe it or not, you, they, they, so they've done all these different surveys and they've asked people questions, they've done experiments where they've tested people, they've shown them fake news and all that stuff. The, 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 the biggest takeaway was that you're really not exposed that much to outright fake news. And even the fake news that you are exposed to, most people are smart enough to like, wait a second, this is questionable information. I should check another source for this and kind of go through that process. Now there are a few that are just political extremists. I think that the, the, the largest danger of fake news is it allows you to, the idea of it allows you to use that term to dismiss truth. And therein lies the biggest danger of the whole process. It, the, the term itself is used as a, as a tool to, um, to cast doubt on otherwise factual information and there that, that's what makes it dangerous and that's what makes it so sinister it's not that we're just overwhelmed with it now i will say during the election cycle and i've told different students this like whatever your initial assessment was of those candidates when it first came out go ahead and stick with that because everything else you're going to hear is just going to be slander and lies right uh especially as you get closer and closer and we're not going to put this part on the podcast <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll cut this part out uh but but honestly, um, in terms of making sense of it, I, I, if you're going to participate in the political process, it has to be one that, that's open and willing to change its position. Where you fall into a trap is when, when you approach a conversation without it actually entailing a conversation, where you're just projecting your opinion out there into space without actually wanting to hear or absorb the other side. And, and that's the problem with our politics right now. And it does go back to your comment about uh, social media platforms and how you just blast out stuff. It's this brand, this idea of branding self. And the algorithms message. right now, particularly, I, well, I won't mention any of the particular, but with our most popular platforms, the algorithms are designed to feed us back things that we will want to like. That's right. And yeah. so you're, you're living in an information bubble and you're, you're just zapping out an information bubble and it's non-discursive and that in part is because the social media platforms themselves are designed to advertise things to you. They're free because you are the product and you're being marketed things. And so it, it, it can't really escape its designed usage, the way the platforms are constructed. It'd be like if I made an AK-47 and I said, here's an AK-47, go out and make the world a safer place. All you can do is point it at people. It's, that's what it's designed to do. And in a platform that's <laughs> go designed- Go plant trees, to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah go, go do something else with it. Um, uh, on systems that are designed to market and sell things, it's hard to do anything other than market and sell yourself on them. And that is part of the, the issue that we face. And, but that's not just us, it's every system. Um, and so it's- Question back here. Yes, sir. In plant biology, I think this is a follow-up or related to the other question. And, and you guys almost hit on it there, but you didn't say the term. And it sounds like this is not something you do personally, but maybe you know if people are doing the same kind of thing to address this problem of confirmation bias. Um, I've, I've read work and been exposed to work by Julia Galef, and she's got uh, some wonderful presentations on um, why you think you're right, even if you're wrong, <laughs> and, and really tries to unpackage um, confirmation bias, why, why you're so gravitated towards things that um, confirm your pre-existing beliefs, and why it's so challenging just in general. Uh, many of the things that, that Dr. Sewell was talking about, um, how we, we, are, we have information that's sort of tailored to us, our environments are tailored to us, we very rarely have to reconcile ourselves with other people's rules or formats. Uh, and that breeds an inherent sort of anti-intellectualism. Her solution to it is to approach things from what she calls a scout mindset. That is to say, I'm gonna go into this assuming that my position is incorrect and, and search and feel that I'm gonna hypothesis test as much as I can my environment um, and, and never really be satisfied, frankly speaking, that intellectual curiosity is our greatest gift as a species why not use that um, to make our world a better place rather than just thinking that we're right and beating people over the head who don't conform to our standard? And that's the solution. How you make that into a workable, packageable skill set, 
<clears throat> to make a pitch for narrative. Um, I think that we can, and we are, we, we designed a game called Rebuilding Main Street that forced people to sit down, you took on different civic roles, and you tried to s collectively solve a problem. It wasn't a competition-based game, it was a cooperative game where you learned how to work together with one another. We're doing the same thing with the Syrian refugee camp where we're teaching cooperative actions, how to incorporate other people's worldview into your own. But fundamentally, it's an educational issue. Like, you have to teach people to be curious. And uh, it's awesome to be at a university system because we get to go out and say that to, to places that that is a completely foreign concept to. And so it's, it's cool that we get to, we kind of balance between the, the diplomatic universe, the military universe, and the academic side. Uh, sometimes we're not at home at any one of the three necessarily because we do such integrated work. But it lets us bring that academic curiosity to those other fronts, and it's really cool. Next question back here. Hi, I'm Nancy Kaplow. I'm a linguistics professor in the English department. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about your work. Um, I'm, I think this is really exciting. I'm uh, wondering if you can help me get a more clear picture in my mind of what you really present in terms of a narrative trajectory from your research, from your scraping, and what your product is. How does that fit in? I just don't quite see exactly what you're with it, what, what the it product like. is. We got the inputs, we got the process a bit. What's the product? Yeah, yeah. so I, we actually have a variety of different products. It really, this is going to sound like a, like a balk on the question a bit, and it sort of is in a way. But um, you know where to find it. That's now, right. You know, you know um, it but it really does depend on the question that we're asked because sometimes it, the, the questions are, are, are wildly different. Sometimes we're the only team working on the project, and sometimes we're working with 25 others. Uh, I've worked on projects before where we've worked on it for nine months, and CENTCOM gives us five minutes to put all of our stuff into a, a quick briefing in a, in a PowerPoint presentation where we just go over the, the narrative highlights as it relates to policy. When we worked with DHS, they've asked us to flesh out specifically how is this policy, the Remain in Mexico policy, uh, talked about amongst these migrant communities. What ex how exactly are they talking about? What exactly do they view as cooperative action? What exactly do they talk about in terms of, of negative things that the United States is doing? And so it takes a lot of different forms. Most oftentimes we try to have like a very brief sort of synopsis and then a full detailed report that you can actually look and read through all the narratives yourself Examples and package them that yeah. way. So a full report from us would have a, a brief summary, sort of a, a literature review and a contextualization of the environment for which the question relates. And then we'll give you block chunks of the narrative examples to kind of put you in the, the setting, put you in the story, put you into the conversation. And then after that, we'll do all the, narr the narrative mapping stuff where you can see this certain narrative tracked this way, this narrative resonated with this, this audience. Uh, and it sort of looks like that, so a, a multi-layered kind of breakdown. Is that responsive? Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I think we got time for one more question. Right here. Hi, my name's Evan Lewis. I've got 20 years in journalism. Uh, so my question is, how did you factor out the bias that is in, just embedded in all media, social media, print media, whatever it is, that there is a bias in all of it. So how did you guys factor that out? Cool, great question. So with the, um, with the election study specifically, uh, one of the things that we did was really intentionally look at the news sources themselves. So is this a state-run news agency? Is this a voiced oppositional news agency? And so what we try to do as best we can, sometimes it's really messy with some of the state-run stuff. Sometimes it's super messy when you start talking about social media platforms and accounts and where that information is coming from. But depending on the question, what we attempt to do, and like a, a, a general question that we get, we try to get like the, the full range of the political spectrum that we're aware of that manifests itself in different media aspects. So we intentionally look for oppositional sources and take a sampling of those. We intentionally look for state-sponsored uh, media and take samples from those. We intentionally look for at least those sources that claim that they're objective and neutral um, and account for those. And oftentimes when we present our work, you'll see this is the aggregate story and information that's coming out broken down. Here's how that differs by uh, pro-state media, neutral media, um, oppositional media. We did that with the election study very specifically. Uh, so in Russia, it was a breakdown like, here are the oppositional uh, news media. Here's their take on Clinton and Trump. Here's 
uh, objective journalist take on um, Clinton and Trump. Here's state-run media. Here's the general public via social media. So you get a breakdown of it, categorized. Is it perfect? Not even close. But we attempt to sort of get at that and account for it. But everybody brings to bear their own individual biases. The other thing that I would say is just to revert back to my previous answer and say that, again, we do not presume by any stretch of the imagination that the information that we hear is actually factual. Instead, we just try to understand the specific audience for that message and knowing that gets at what we're more, more interested in, which is things like identity and, uh, and direction. Well, put it on pause for just a second because I need to, uh, I need, before we wrap up and, and thank Dr. Cooley, I need to ask a couple of questions of the audience here. So this being Mardi Gras, tomorrow Fat Tuesday, all the parades have been happening in Mardi Gras, all sorts of places. So who has been to a Mardi Gras parade in the last year? Anybody? All right, he gets some swag right here. <laughs> oh, swag. Has anybody wild. actually ever ridden in a Mardi Gras parade? Oh, there's the other <laughs> two. Okay, we've accounted for it. So right, the, the journalist who just asked the last question, he's the other. Okay, so we had a little bit of swag. There's, there's some OSU research on tap swag. We, we look for excuses to give that away at every event and that, was, that happened to be our one for now. So now as, uh, as I present Dr. Cooley with our uh, OSU research on tap medallion, which also, if you look closely, has a, a little bottle opener there to oh, double on it. Very nice, very Help nice. me thank Dr. Very Cooley nice. for this great talk. Thank you guys so much, thank y'all. Cool. So you are, you are in an elite group now, oh, Dr. Cooley, cool. so fantastic. Now our next research on tap, March 23rd, week later than usual, 5.30 right here at Iron Monk Tap Room, we'll be talking to Dr. Greg Clare. I'll bet our associate dean from that college knows who Dr. Greg Clare is. Um, uh, the associate professor of design, housing, and merchandising. And our topic will be seeing the light. Yes, I see the light. Can, can lighting design actually impact our health and our pocketbook? So we really cover the spectrum here with OSU Research on Tap. But until then, a toast. Sorry you left your water back with your wife. But our toast tonight, may your intellect be meritorious, your impact be broad, and may the stories you tell about yourself be both true and uplifting. So thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Super fun.